Well, creationists have always had as their goal to get evolution either out of the classroom or if it has to be taught, get presented in a way that students will not accept it because evolution is the big enemy. Evolution is the idea you want to protect your children from if you are a creationist. So they've tried various ways of, of um, denigrating evolution uh, of initially back in the early part of the 20th century, um, they tried to ban the teaching of evolution completely. And of course, that's why the Scopes trial was held. It was uh, held over the Butler Act in Tennessee, which had to do with uh, banning the teaching of evolution. And we all know what happened in the Scopes trial. Scopes lost. And actually, evolution disappeared from the high school curriculum until approximately the 19, early 1960s. Uh, there was about a 30-year period there where you'd be hard-pressed to find any, any evolution in textbooks or in the high school curriculum. Evolution started coming back into the curriculum in the 1960s, and that actually created the movement that we now call creation science, which was an effort to try to, um, try to um, ameliorate the evil effects of evolution, so to speak, by teaching creation science along with it as a way of getting students to uh, disbelieve or distrust in evolution. In the late 80s, um, laws requiring the teaching of creation science with evolution were struck down by the Supreme Court, and creation science is still around, but nobody's really seriously trying to argue that it be taught to balance evolution. This is where the new form of creationism, intelligent design, comes in. Intelligent design was crafted shortly before the um, Supreme Court decision in the late 1980s to try to come up with a creationism that would be more legally bulletproof than creation science proved to be. And it's now in the courts at this time in the late uh, in, in late 2005, and we'll find out whether it uh, survives or not. I think it probably won't. But all along, the creationists have tried to uh, present evolution as weak theory, as something that students shouldn't take seriously, as something that uh, uh, should be disbelieved. And that will that is continued alongside of efforts to try to balance the teaching of evolution with uh, some form of creationism, and it will continue even after the probable demise of intelligent design. Creationists have had to evolve. They have an evolutionary history, and it has to do with, with the fact that they always lose in court. They've never won a federal court case, and, but there are some major cases that have forced them after each of these major losses to morph into something a little different. Um, the first of these major cases was the 1968 Epperson versus Arkansas. That Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court ruling said that you could not ban evolution in a public school uh, because prior to that a number of states like Arkansas, Tennessee had laws trying to ban evolution. Well in 1968 the Supreme Court said you can't do that. You cannot ban evolution. It has to be there. If it's part of the required curriculum, it's going to be there. So after that, creationists said, OK, well, if we can't ban it, we'll try to get in alongside it. And so they came up with um, creation science, trying to make science uh, or creationism, trying to get it in alongside to balance, to balance it off against evolution. So then there was another. A uh, court case that came out of my own state of Louisiana, the 1987 Edwards versus Aguillard ruling, saying that you cannot balance science with religion. You cannot balance evolution with creation science, no matter how much you try to make creationism sound scientific. Just calling it creation science won't work. So most people, I think, thought that the 87 Edwards decision would finally put a stop to creationism, except that it didn't. Creationists realized if they were going to continue their efforts, they were going to have to change even more. They were going to have to get rid of the term creationism in the label that they gave themselves. They were going to have to get rid of some of the sillier claims they were making, such as that the Earth is only six to 10,000 years old. They knew they couldn't get to square one, referring explicitly all the time to the Bible, to the book of Genesis. So in the early 80s, a group of creationists who morphed into the intelligent design movement 
got rid of the label creationism, at least in their public activities, but only after they were well established in the public in their own, among their own followers as creationists. So they've had to come the overcome the obstacle of the Constitution. Or they've been trying to overcome the obstacle of the Constitution. And after every major loss, they've had to regroup under slightly, using slightly different terminology. So what they keep doing is sanitizing their terminology, trying to get around the Constitution by fooling federal judges, which is what the intelligent design movement is presently trying to do. The Constitution is their biggest obstacle. The most recent obstacle placed in the path of the intelligent design movement and creationism in general is the ruling that Judge John Jones handed down in Kitzmiller versus Dover Area School District. That ruling was handed down on December 20th, 2005. Judge Jones recognized really every aspect of the intelligent design movement that it was important for him to recognize. He understands that it's religion. He recognized that. He understood that it's creationism in disguise, just with slightly new clothes, new terminology. And he recognized how they are shifting their language. That's in his decision. Um, he also recognized something else very important. He recognizes the historical context out of which intelligent design grew, that it came directly out of the creation science movement, that their arguments are the same. They've made a few cosmetic changes. They've gotten rid of uh, the far out claims like the young age of the earth. But Judge Jones recognized that we're simply dealing with a new version of creationism. And he really threw the book at these people. And it's going to be very hard for them to get over this obstacle in the sense that he issued such a strong opinion that it's going to serve as a legal guidepost for any other judge that has to make a decision on in future court cases. Uh, what the intelligent design movement would really love to have is, a, and what they've been trying to get, is a, a court case, a lawsuit, in an area where they think they really own the judges and where they have control over the, the pro-intelligent design players in the lawsuit and where they control the terminology. But Judge Jones has placed a big obstacle in front of them because he recognized how they're sanitizing their terminology. They're now presenting themselves as people who want to teach more about evolution. They just want to teach the strengths and weaknesses of evolution. They want to teach the evidence against evolution. They want to teach the controversy about evolution that supposedly exists among scientists. They want to teach all of the, everything except intelligent design, supposedly except that Judge Jones in Kitzmiller versus Dover Area School District saw through all of those linguistic subterfuges and really put a block in front of them. I think any other judge that has to rule on an intelligent design case, the first thing he's going to do or she will read Judge Jones's ruling.